Good morning, everybody. Um, um, appreciate the opportunity to be here, participating in CIF Digital. I uh, want to thank uh, David Razik and the organizer for inviting me to participate at one of the meetings that I love the most every year. And um, I have the opportunity to talk today to you about um, complications of mitral valve repair with MitroClip. What, we, what uh, have we learned? I have no disclosure pertaining to this co uh, conference. So when we talk about structural heart disease and valvular heart disease, it's very common in adults as they get older. And mitral valve disease is the predominant valvular heart disease as you get older. So mitral clip was the first transcatheter uh, technique to be approved for repair of the mitral valve, applying the concept of uh, grasping the leaflets, uh, like the Alfieri technique was done in surgery in the past. More than 100,000 procedures have been done worldwide since, since the approval. So the experience with mitral valve repair in, in mitral clip is being incredible since the approval. Number one, if you know, if you look at the procedure of the STS ACC uh, registry, the success rate of this procedure is excellent with a 93% success rate. The incidence of complication like a uh, single leaflet that, uh, device attachment is only 1.5 with a very low mortality and 90% of the patients are able to go home with a success rate of the procedure of 92%. If you look at all the data, and, uh, and, the, and the most important uh, uh, follow-up with the uh, high-risk uh, degenerative mitral insufficiency group, if you look at the complications rate up to five years, there were no uh, SLDA or, or single leaflet device attachment uh, in the first year and not in, in, the, in the first five years. This group of patients was very high risk with the degenerative mitral insufficiency, uh, residual mitral stenosis was very, very low. Embolization of the device was zero. And second, second intervention for uh, adding more devices was uh, 2%. Uh, you look at the functional MR, the same, the same uh, findings, you know, the procedure complication rate was very, very small. Uh, uh, embolizations were 0.3% and single leaflet attachment 0.7%. Very, very, very rare. And if you look at the, of the across the uh, across the ocean and with the mitra FR, very similar to the findings with COAP. So the procedure really is very, very safe with minimal complications. We put together all the all the all the groups, high risk, the SDS registry after after approval and the post approval. Um, uh, our sponsor protocol, the results were very similar. All the complications were very low. The mortality was low in this group of patients um, and device embolization uh, and other complications were extremely, extremely low. But there was not, 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 not always very, very, uh, very good. There were a group of patients that did poorly. And the predictors of where, which patients did more, more uh, worse were patients who we, we were not so successful in reducing the mitral insufficiency. If you have residual MR after the procedure, three or four plus or more, uh, the survival of these patients at one year was very low, 50% mortality. The same happened if you have residual tricuspid insufficiency. You had a 40% mortality at one year. So those two things uh, really, uh, brought to our attention that was there was not everything was so rosy. The three more important predictors of outcome at one year mortality was patients who were in state renal disease on hemodialysis, uh, severe TR and severe residual MR. Um, and those patients don't have a mortality of 2%. Those patients have a mortality in hospital mortality of 10.2% in the registry in a one-year mortality of almost 50%. So how do you define these patients? So anatomy becomes very important. Once the device was approved, the anatomy of patients that we were uh, performing this procedure was changed. It was not the A2P2s, now you have more complex anatomy, cleft, 
leaflets, uh, uh, commissura pro prolapse, Barlow's patients, and uh, multi-segment prolapse, uh, post mitral valve repairs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those group of patients, those patients with, with a very difficult anatomy, you're not gonna have the same results. But since then, uh, the XTR microclip was introduced which allow us to do something different. We, we are able to, to grasp more tissue and that also changed. So anatomy is key. This is an example of a patient that is not suitable for transcatheter mitral valve repair with mitral clip. Heavy calcification with max, there's nowhere to, to grasp. This patient should not be done. So how we select which patients are better for uh, the XTR or, lo or for longer uh, long grasping versus the NTR? If you have a long leaflet, yes, XTR will favorable. A2P2, flare leaflets, redundant leaflets, those are good for that. But if you have restricted leaflets, have calcified calcifications uh, of a small uh, mitral valve area, then the NTR or small clip will be much, much better. Uh, let's look at an example. This is a patient with severe mitral insufficiency. You can see that uh, you go, you start your grasping maneuver, you put perpendicular to the plane of coaptation with an XTR. And then you do your grasping maneuvers and you're grasping, you have beautiful grasping, you're getting a lot of tissue. Uh, you grasp and you have excellent position and uh, a lot of tissue is, being, uh, is, is on both sides. The gradient is only two millimeters of mercury after uh, mean gradient across uh, across the mitral valve, and uh, you assess the grasping is very very good, uh, and then you're ready to release. You release the, the the clip with an excellent result. You can see here significant reduction of MR in four plus to to trace to mild MR, and uh, the next day you do an echo to follow up, the patient is getting short of breath, and you find this. Same patient, 24 hours later, you have this finding, which is a, a single leaflet device attachment. And the patient is very symptomatic, the MR is backed. So this is a complication that is relatively low, 1.5%, 0.7% in the registry. But when it happens, you have to take action. And what do you do? You bring the patient back to the cast lab and just put a second clip next to where the uh, flail, uh, the uh, detachment is, and you correct the problem. You pay a price, obviously, because the gradient now is not gonna be two millimeters of mercury. Now you have a gradient of five millimeters of mercury, but you're still gonna have a good result. And this is the final result in this particular patient. An 85-year-old patient with severe MR and TR, very symptomatic. So the patient is, is brought to the cath lab and is, has a repair of the mitral valve very successfully with an XTR and an NTR. Excellent grasping, excellent uh, reduction of the mitral insufficiency you can see here. And then we move to the tricuspid valve. This is done off-label. It was done with the, uh, with the same delivery system that we have for the mitral clip. And we, uh, we're grasping, but we can't grasp. You can see here, uh, we're perpendicular, but there's no way, there's no, we couldn't grasp, impossible. So we decided to remove, to remove uh, the clip. When we're removing the clip, then you have a complication that you don't wanna see. There is embolization of the clip, but what you have to do is you have to take the clip out. Uh, fortunately, now you're on, the, you're on the right side of the heart. That's a good thing. And uh, we can use a lot of tools for this. We have uh, uh, a sneer, and we try to sneer one, uh, uh, one uh, arm of the clip and try to grasp it and try to put it down uh, coaxially into the, uh, into the delivery cuff, into the sheath. Uh, by doing that, um, not always is perfect. You have to put some some uh, some pressure and force there. Uh, we have embolization of the of the of the uh, of the pin of the clip, so we we got part of the clip out, but we embolize the the pin. We're like the Marines. We have to we have we never leave anything behind. So you have to go back and do your your best to remove these with snares again, different snare obviously. And once you're able to remove it. 
uh, you we are able to save the situation. Again, this is a very rare complication, but trust me, it, it, it happens. Uh, this is another case, a 75-year-old female with severe mitral insufficiency, congestive heart failure, class 3-4, start to post multiple surgical procedures, or vascular procedure for pelvic AB malformation. So the right femoral axis was not possible. So it, it, the transeptal function has been done, is needed to be done through the left femoral vein, which makes everything a little bit more, a lot more difficult. At the end of the, uh, of the procedure, we, we are left with this. The patient has a, a tear in the, uh, in the septum, you can see here, and has a significant uh, 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 bidirectional shunt of an ASD. Most of the time, if you find this, uh, if the patient is not, a, is not a hypoxemic, uh, it healed by itself, we all know that. And as a matter of fact, in patients who have severe cardiomyopathy, uh, the fact that you're decompressing the left atrium, this transient uh, bidirectional shunt also is helping you to decompress the left atrium at the beginning so the patient doesn't have that increase in afterload and they compensate as it happens in surgery, patient with low, low, low EF. But this is a little bit too much, but we decided at the time that, okay, let's see how the patient does and we'll, we'll close it if it's necessary. The following day, uh, the patient has, uh, SAT, SATs came down to the 90s. The blood pressure is in the 90s with a heart rate of 100, 110, but it's, it's still comfortable. Uh, so the question is, we close or not to close? Uh, we were not happy with the amount of shunt and the hemodynamics are pointing us now that the saturation are dropping. So there's a clear indication for this patient to close the ASD. And the, how do you do that? Well, we always, in these particular patients, want to make sure that when you close it, you're not going to make things worse. So we measure the pulmonary pressures, et cetera, and then size, then size the device uh, like you're doing with a, with, a, with, a, with a congenital ASD, and then proceed with, a, with closure with an uh, ASO device, as you can see here. And then uh, this is the final result. With the, with the ASD closed. This is a little bit more common complication. Uh, in our experience, um, we don't see it that often, but when it happens, you have to be ready to proceed with closing. So this is another case very interesting. This is a patient with a functional bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis that uh, went for, uh, for TAVAR. After TAVAR, we noticed that the patient had a a chordal SAM, and you can see it here. Uh, on the chordal SAM, uh, initial gradient in the, uh, across the valve was two millimeters of mercury, but the gradient in the LVOT post procedure was 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so we decided to see and see what happened. The next day, what, what happened was that the velocity across the valve, the LVOT was six meters per second. So you have significant obstruction of the LVOT by this. Uh, uh, but this coral SAM produced by, by the low uh, uh, implantation of the bioprosthetic aortic valve. So now what? How do you resolve this problem? We have several options. Number one, treat the patient medically and see how he does in the, in the next couple of weeks. You can reduce the septum as we do with the conventional IHSS or obstructive cardiomyopathy to uh, in, uh, increase the LVOT and, and reduce the, uh, the gradient, or there are other possibilities. This is, this is really uh, created by us or by the valve, so we need to find ways to solve this problem. So you can see beautiful uh, images of the, of the SAM and the, and, the, and, the, and the obstruction that it's producing. And we measure the septum, the septum is only 1.3 centimeters. And we realize that making the septum smaller is not gonna solve the problem. Not only that, because it's only 1.3, the chances of uh, creating a VSD or co other complications will be, will be much higher without obtaining the, the results that, that we would like to obtain. So based on that, we have to get rid of the SAM. And the best way to do that is to move the anterior leaflet. 
And the only, the, uh, the best tool that we have for that today, even though it's off label, obviously, uh, is the MitroClip. So here we go and go with the, uh, I think with an MT, uh, MTR uh, a clip. Uh, and uh, just by clipping the, uh, the A2P2 level, level you, are, you are moving the anterior leaflet and resolving the mechanical problem, which is the obstruction uh, of the LVOT. You can see right there, the LVOT after releasing the clip is, is gone. Uh, there's no more obstruction. There's no grade across the valve and the procedure is all. So in conclusion, we have to say that mitral valve repair with mitral clip is a very safe procedure, but complication still can occur. Assessing the complication properly is a key to successful outcome. Imaging is paramount. It's paramount in the, in the road mapping of your strategy for successful procedures. Adequate le leaflet grasping is not always a guarantee of procedure success, since L a single leaflet uh, device attachment can still happen. Mitral valve anatomy, it is predictive of early and late results with the mitral valve uh, repair with the current mitral clip technology. Thank you.